So the obvious question is, how is Chicago doing tonight? Everybody all right? <laughs> Emerald Lagasse here. You know, one of the incredible things since we've been in Chicago is, and one of the best things, is about the steakhouse. And the uh, steakhouses in Chicago priding themselves on everything big. <laughs> big. Not those, yeah. Not those wimpy little steaks, but big. Everything kicked up a notch. Tonight, in tribute to the Chicago Steakhouse, I'm going to cook up a very special dinner. We're going to start with a stacked salad of tomatoes with Vidalia onions and Maytag blue cheese. Woo! For the main course, we're going to do a whole roasted ribeye roast served with a three potato goat cheese gratin. Big, big. And dessert, I'm gonna be baking up a chocolate, chocolate mousse layer cake with vanilla bean ice cream. Yummy, yummy, yummy. Get ready. Get ready, cause it's Emerald Steakhouse and it's all happening right here on Emerald Live. Big. Big. How big? About as big as this conga drum. Give it up for Doc Gibbs and Cliff. <laughs> big. <laughs> Martinis are big. Steaks are big. The sides are big. The reason why the sides are big, you can't fit anything else on the plate. There's a lot of great steakhouses in Chicago, let me tell you. You know, there's that great place, Gibson's. There's, uh, there's one there, huh? I got a little treat for you later on. Look at this. Big. Big. Look. It's a little uh, porterhouse steak. That's a half order at Gibson's. <laughs> So a little filet mignon. See, they don't fool around. They just give you the whole tenderloin. <laughs> it's like have at it. Bring the whole family. How about a uh, strip steak? These are the three most uh, popular steaks. There's a ribeye steak also that's pretty popular. Big potatoes, big tomatoes. It's big, Doc. Big. <laughs> big. You know, uh, in Chicago, since the 1800s, it's been considered in this country, uh, as you guys know, the stockyards were here for so many years, and it's Really, the big shoulders is where it's got its name, where the uh, steaks are referred to and the sides are referred to, everything big. It's because Chicago had big shoulders for so long, carrying the whole country on their backs is the way that we like to say. Speaking about backs, go scratch yours right now. When we come back, we're going to kick it up a notch. Stick around. We'll be right back. <laughs> Bam, you come on down to Gibson Steakhouse, you get your peppercorn filet, you get your big lobster tail, you let Mohammed take care of you, you get your giant potato, and you wash it out down with a giant martini. We want to have you. Hey, hey, everybody, welcome back. Give it up for Doc Gibbs and Cliff, everybody. All right, if you just fell off another planet, you have landed on Emerald Live. You should be with us because we're live in Chicago, everybody. Yeah. 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 
You know, when you come here, you talk about all the stockyards, you talk about all the steaks, and really how Chicago has really influenced parts of the country. For all these great steakhouses, there's been a lot of them that have been around for a long time. And in Chicago, of course, you know, there's Morton's and there's Gene and Giorgetti's, and there's so many steakhouses, but there's one, because he's one of my main men, okay? There's one steakhouse called Gibson's, and if you've been to Gibson's, you know this guy right here. This is Mo right here. Yeah. Mo is the man. Mo is the man. All right. As a matter of fact, you go to Gibson's, any one of those guys are great. But the biggest thing that I love is the introduction. If you've never been there, ask for Mo. Mo, give us a little spiel right All now, All right, please. everybody, let's talk beef tonight. Chicago cut a bone-in ribeye. Nice and charred, rare to mid rare, medium at the most. Pick up that bone, chew on it, a lot of good beef on that bone. Excellent cut of meat, Chicago cut. We have a filet with peppercorns. I can peppercorn any steak you like. Peppercorns will be crunchy and hot. Bony New York sirloin. Pick up and chew on it. Don't be ashamed. A lot of good beef on that bone. For the house, you get the best of the both world, filet and sirloin. London broil, nice and lean, rare to mid rare, medium at the most. We will not cook above and over medium on that London broil. Whether y'all like it or not, we really don't care. <laughs> Two pounds of lobster. All right. And we got a beautiful lobster tail here, two pounds, tender and sweet. Chop it up, put it up the middle, order your steaks of your choice, a little soy and toy for the family. How's that, chef? Excellent! Oh, yes. Yes. yes! You've been there a long time, huh, my friend? God bless. Ten years. Ten years, Ten Mo's been there. Years. I know this restaurant, look at this steak right here. Unbelievable. Great modeling. Unbelievable steaks. I'll tell you, I just, I'm so delighted you're here. It's an honor. And uh, as you know, I'm a bigger fan. I love you. As you as I am the steakhouse. <laughs> Thank hey, you. Hey, this would be a good time for you to go gnaw on that bone. When we come back, we're kicking it up a notch. Stay with us. We'll be right back. everybody we got the steakhouse blues going on over there and uh, good friend Mo is right here I hope you didn't miss that little uh, jingle that he just did about the steaks Mo give us a little quick run around just yeah, about this one again nice bone and in ribeye rare to mid rare you got a filet with peppercorns anything can be peppercorn crunchy spicy hot bone in New York sirloin pick up and chew on it don't the be size shy of that thing. it's a beautiful nice <laughs> and thick two and a half stock guard again like you said porterhouse your classic t-bone filet and sirloin London is nice and lean like I said, rare to mid-rare. And the miniature lobsters. And the miniature lobsters. There you go. There you have it. All right. One of my favorite salads to have at a steakhouse, now that we're switching gears just a little bit, are these beautiful tomatoes. They always have nice tomatoes, either beefsteak tomatoes. In New Orleans, we have these beautiful Creole tomatoes. Nice, ripe, beautiful smell. Getting to be that time of the year as well. And uh, Vidalia onions. Now, if you don't have Vidalia onions, those are the onions that come from Georgia that are very, very sweet and delicious. But there are a lot of onions throughout the summer that happen as well. Texas sweet onions, the Midwest sweet onions are also great. The Vidalia onions are easy to spot because they'll have a little sticker on them. And, uh, yeah, really. Don't go there, please. G. We're staying with G for Gibsons. You see what I'm saying? G. And, uh... Basically, one of my favorite ones that I want to do for you really, really quick is this simple salad that I absolutely love. I take Maytag blue cheese, which is this cheese from Iowa, 
It's a Midwest thing. Love it. Fritz Maytag and his family have been making cheese for a long time. They also make Anchor Steam beer and a really fantastic American blue cheese. Great vein in it. Ages for about six months. What I like to do is take the juice of about two lemons and uh, add that, no seeds of course, inside of some crumbled blue cheese. Then, I like to of course add a little bit of salt and some pepper so it tastes good. And I like a lot of fresh ground pepper with my blue cheese dressing. Then, what I then do is take a tiny bit of cream. I take a tiny bit of cream, add the cream in there. If you don't, you can also use buttermilk. And buttermilk gives it a nice flavor. Just a little bit in there. And then what I do is I just kind of start, sort of almost like I'm macerating like fruit. I just sort of start wetting the blue cheese up like that. I don't use any egg. You can use an egg and emulsify it and really make a great blue cheese dressing. This is more kind of a vinaigrette. Then what I do is I take some good olive oil and then I slowly start, just with a fork, I'm, I don't even have a whisk, I am just start slowly drizzling in some of this good olive oil like this to make this blue cheese vinaigrette that we're going to make. Watch this how it's going to come in there. You see, it's all starting to come together. Now if you like it real cheesy, you could stop there. If you want to get a little bit more volume, you can add a little bit more olive oil like that. Generally I tell people not to add all the olive oil at one time so it doesn't break. You want to add a little bit at a, a, little bit at a time and then when it's made, it's very, very simple to keep this right in the ice box, airtight container or your favorite dressing container. Keep it in the refrigerator until you want to use it stays really good in the refrigerator and it's just really awesome. Okay, there we have that. Gonna taste that, make sure that it's seasoned properly. Then, you can ask yourself, self! <laughs> so that's what I always do every morning. I, self! Do I wanna kick it up a notch? Yeah! Then there you can do that. You can just add a little hot sauce like that or a lot of hot sauce to kick it up. And you can add a little Lee and Perrins if you want like that. And uh, kind of mix that in there. Adjust the seasoning and it's absolutely fantastic. I have some in the refrigerator as well. This is looking pretty awesome just like this. Watch how simple this salad is. Okay. Big uh, fancy plate that I got here. Pretend you're just kind of driving Miss Daisy if you want, you know. <laughs> and then what I like to do is I like to take not too thick but not too thin slices of Vidalia onion. We'll come back to that. You can see I have these round croutons. And I like this crouton for the crunch. Instead of regular croutons, you know, that you get in a salad, I'm going to show you how we're going to put this together. And then, of course, I've got these uh, wonderful beefsteak tomatoes. Some people think that you should take the core out. Okay, we'll take the core out. You got those little tomato core kind of things. Look, that's how simple it is. We'll get rid of this little spot right here, not too much, right down to the skin. And then basically, we'll slice these about a quarter of an inch thick. And then basically now we're ready to put the salad together. One thing, pet peeve of mine, you got to season these tomatoes. When you're going to cut them like this, you should wait till you're ready to use them to cut them. And then you should season both sides, and I'm going to show you how we're going to do that, with salt and pepper. And what happens is that as soon as you add the salt and the pepper to the tomato, it's just, it's the flavor just like starts happening. Now, here's what we're going to do. Take a slice, put them on the bottom of the plate. Now we come back and season this side right over here. Then, one little crouton. Maybe another little crouton here. I will put another one here, why not? I'm in the crouton mode. Nice slice of Vidalia onion. Again, little seasoning. Another beautiful slice of tomato. Another slice of onion. And maybe we'll do like another little crouton coming out this way. If you like croutons. If not, forget about it. You just throw them like that. Then, season them up. You can stack this as high as the Hancock building, basically, if you want. You know, you really can. Little onion like that. I learned this little trick. Then, 
Always a little extra blue cheese, just off to the side like this. Kind of hit it one more time with some fresh cracked pepper like that. A little bit of garnish. And then you just kind of finish it with this blue cheese vinaigrette that you make. I like to have it sort of dripping along the sides like that, if you know what I'm saying. Little on top like that. Like I said, you can go as high or as low as you want. Put as much dressing as you want. That's how simple it is there. My friend, I'm going to give that, let you start right there. Then we'll pass it around and make some friends. And when we come back, whole roasted ribeye, stick around. Welcome back, everybody. Emerald Lagasse here, and welcome to Emerald Steakhouse. And give it up for Doc Gibbs and Cliff, everybody. <laughs> what I thought, big, what I thought we would do, big, is uh, show you a little simple roast that you can do and share with a lot of people. And if you go down to the butcher, and also in Chicago here, well, in the country itself, but in Chicago, this is what is referred to as a 109, or better known as you guys know, as prime rib, where they roast this rib on the bone. You can see this beautiful eye here, both sides, one from the chuck side and one from the loin side. And I thought I would uh, kick you up a couple of notches with, uh, with this dish right here. Before I start showing you how to trim this, or at least the way I would do it, I've got a roasting pan on the stove right now getting blazing hot. Uh, you can do this on the grill, but we want to sear it is the, uh, is the whole thing of what we're going to try to do. Season it and sear it before we roast it inside of the oven for that perfect medium rare or medium. Now, some of the trim, you can do this whole. There's a lot of wonderful flavor. The thing that prime rib gets a lot of flavor from is obviously the fat, when it begins to start shrinking, just gets a lot of the flavor, not only in this rib pot or better known as a ribeye steak. If this bone was off particularly, you could really cut ribeye steaks. But here, where the bone is, there's a lot of wonderful flavor in that. One of the things that I like to do to just sort of get it even going the flavor a little more is to trim this a little bit. Not that I want to take away from any of this, but what I do is I make a cut like this down to the bone, and then I just kind of take the meat away from the bone like this. Of course, this is not the right knife I should be using for this should be using a boning knife. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to show you basically where this bone is, where the prime rib comes from. Ha, ah, a boning knife. <laughs> so what we're going to do now is we're going to make a strip here. Watch your fingers, of course. Your butcher will be more than happy to do this for you. And then basically, you can kind of go in between. This is where they get a lot of the beef ribs in a lot of the restaurants, they'll take that. I hate to waste that meat. That meat is just too delicious to, to waste. So it really depends if you want to trim it or not. That's why I'm not trimming a lot of the bone off on this thing. We could really go down and make a whole rack of this and almost like sort of like a French rack and go down. But I think that there's so much delicious meat in between this. But I wanted to show you these kind of bones. And basically, big, as we say, you cut one of those. That's so you got one of those monster rib rib steaks like that or you can roast it whole like this and you can have prime rib or roast rack of rib is another name that it's called and uh, now what we're going to do is we're going to start searing this why do people sear meat particularly in restaurants hopefully they sear meat is because you want to sear the fat and sear in the juices so that it goes in the inside and either tenderizes it even more I'm going to season the outside of this with some salt and pepper on both sides. Now, in New Orleans, we'd add some Creole spice to this and really kick it up a few notches. And uh, that's totally up to you, your favorite spice that you like. So what we're going to then do now that that side is seasoned is just that. We're going to begin to start seasoning this in this pan. 
The skillet is dry, so it's going to um, seem to be very smoky at first because there's no oil or anything in that. But that's exactly the method of searing like this that we want to begin to start doing. Then we're going to turn this thing over and season this side before we turn it over with salt and pepper. Again, we could also do it with Creole seasoning as well. Now, while that's searing, one of the things, almost had to call my buddies at the fire department. Almost had to call my buddies at the fire department. Good example right here. If uh, you are ever going to do this dish or anything working with puddings or pastry creams, and you've got cream or milk on the stove, you want to be careful that it never boils over. And it will boil over, as you just saw here a second ago. If it boils over, try not to panic and take the pan off the stove. It will ignite because of the butter fat that's inside of that. But one of the side dishes that I absolutely want to do for you guys that I absolutely love is the street potato gratin. What do I mean by that? That's a big word. Well, I've got some cream here, and I've got... One of my favorite ingredients, which is garlic. I've got a couple of heads of garlic. And what I want to do is I want to flavor and slowly bring up that cream and start letting it reduce a little bit. I want to do that with some salt and with some pepper. I think we're out to have a fire here this afternoon. That's <laughs> Never fear, though. Never fear. The firemen and I are like this. <laughs> a lot of that is from the oil right there and can easily be put out. <laughs> oh, yeah, it can easily be put out easily, you know, <laughs> like outside. <laughs> Joking aside, you really do have to be careful. What really ignited is that a lot of this natural juice right here that hopefully you can see hasn't really got quite on that pan yet. And uh, it's really just so hot. We've got it because we're searing it. That's exactly what we're trying to do is sear in that juices. Then we got the oven on about 400 degrees that we want to start roasting this for. And I'm going to give you some calculations on that in a little bit. Generally, a rule of thumb is about 10 to 12 minutes per pound for a medium rare. Okay? But... A lot of it depends on the size and the cut and the bone. So you should get to know your butcher, where you're buying your meat from, and ask him and consult with him or her of what they think about uh, per pound cooking. Like I said, that's an average, about 10, 12 minutes per pound for medium rare. Now, what we're going to do is slowly bring up this cream. And then what we're going to do is we're extracting that garlic flavor out of this cream as it starts to reduce, just like I'm doing right here. Then, as I have mine... After it reduces for about 15 minutes or so, what do I mean by that? Well, generally the cream is reduced now. See, like it almost, what they call, can coat a spoon. You see, that's what that term means. But this cream is happy because it's, it's just tasting terrific like garlic. I've got some Yukon gold small potatoes. I've got some sweet potatoes. And I've got some... Delicious, uh, regular, little, small Idaho potatoes. I butter the casserole, and here's what you can do for a really, really fantastic, fantastic dish. What you want to do is kind of get a lot of that flavor of the garlic out, and you can remove the garlic. Hey, if you don't want to remove it, you're not going to hurt my feelings. You can strain it as well. We'll get a... Uh, bit of the garlic out of there, but we got all of this flavor in here. Now, what's going to happen, we've also got a little bit of goat cheese. A couple of things that you can do. You can take the goat cheese and sort of mix the goat cheese in the cream if you want and let it sort of di dilute. Or you can sprinkle the goat cheese. You can sprinkle the goat cheese if you want in between the layers because that's exactly what we're going to start doing now. What we're going to start doing is this. We're going to take some white potatoes on this buttered casserole like this. Make a layer like we're making lasagna, except we're using potato. And then we're going to use a little bit of seasoning, a little bit of salt, 
on those potatoes and a little bit of pepper. Then we're going to come and we're going to add a layer of sweet potatoes. Just like this. And then basically what we're going to do, see there's got some gaps in there even though that we're laying these. We've got some gaps in there. Then we'll do another layer of potato. What's going to happen is that we're going to take this goat cheese cream or the other way that you can do it, like I said, is save the goat cheese for on top, which will make this wonderful crust, okay? But what we're going to do when we get done layering all of that, we're going to add all of that goat cheese cream and then that goat cheese, as you can see, on the top that we're going to spread around, seasoned, and we're going to bake this inside of the oven in this wonderful garlic cream in this gratin. When we come back, I'm going to show you how to just put it all together as far as this wonderful rib roast and this potato gratin, and then it's on to dessert. Stick around. We'll be right back. Doc Gibbs, everybody, and Cliff. Now, before we move ahead and get into our big dessert, we seared that wonderful roast. That took about 15 minutes in total time, both sides. Put it inside that pan, roasting it in the oven. And our roast basically took about an hour and 15 minutes from that time trying to get to the perfect medium rare stage. Okay? See how that is right there? Now. When you're done putting that garlic cream with the goat cheese over the potatoes that we layered to make that gratin, you want to take that casserole pan and put it inside of a sheet pan to save your oven. If you don't care about your oven or maybe you're over your mother-in-law's house or something like that, <laughs> don't worry about any of that stuff, you know. Basically, you can see how this thing is just like oozing away. You see that right there? That's what happens when you have the Evelyn Wood speed oven. <laughs> it's amazing, just amazing. So if you're unsure, and some of the folks said, hey, we're a little unsure about you know, our, our roast or how long. If you're really unsure with roasting things, whether it's a chicken or a pork roast or a beef roast like we did, you can always go and invest inside of a very simple oven thermometer, OK? A lot of them will even tell you exactly what is medium, what is rare, what is medium well, et cetera, on the thermometer. And they're an inexpensive investment, but a great thing if you're going to roast a lot of whole pieces of meat or chickens or birds or whatever. Because let me tell you, this piece of meat right here, this big Chicago beef right here, doesn't have one of those wimpy little thermometers that come out <laughs> that pop off and say, I'm medium rare. You want to let that sort of rest also. You know, always roast should rest a good at least five, if not ten minutes. And what happens is it just sort of seals in the juices, the natural juices, particularly like that wonderful juice of medium rare or medium. It keeps it contained in there. If we were to cut a big piece of this right now, that would instantly just run right through the whole piece of meat. And we have no more juices here and as it sat for 10 or 15 minutes. Now, if you want that, go ahead. Whack yourself off a hunk. See what I care. 
Now, while we're letting that rest a little bit, also the gratin, bubbly, very, very, very hot, still hot, as you can see. So we're going to let this rest a minute. Now, we're going to make a chocolate cake. Not only are we going to make a chocolate cake, we're going to make a genoise. Big fancy word, genoise. I've got eggs and I've got sugar in here that I've started beating up in a whisk. And I'm actually doubling the size of this thing. It's a natural leavening agent. You don't know what a leavening agent is. Leavening agent can be baking powder. Makes it poofy, makes it rise. This doesn't have that in it. It's natural. Eggs will naturally do that, of course, with air. That's exactly what we're doing is putting air into this. Now, I'm going to add a little bit of baking powder to some cocoa and flour, and I'm going to sift this. I'm going to sift it, particularly when you're using cocoa, so that you can eliminate all that kind of stuff right there. Then, next thing we're going to do, cake pans, big, <laughs> butter, sugar. Did that, coated all the sides like this, they're ready to go. You're ready to make your genoise. You put your oven on about 350 degrees. Very simple cake, very light, very airy. This is only going to take about 20, 25 minutes to bake these. Here's how you do it. When the eggs and the sugar double in size like this and we got all that aeration in there, now we're ready to go. You see how it's just kind of getting in that ribbon stage? This is what we're going to do. We're going to take that off like that. We're going to take the whisk off. Then, what we're going to do now, that's the, that's the cake batter song by Doc Gibbs. <laughs> what we're going to do now is we're going to take that, mix our cocoa and flour together, and then we're going to actually start making our cake batter. And I'm going to show you how we're going to do that. See how nice and airy that looks like that? That's why it's called a genoise, nice and airy. Then, we're going to take that mixture in here, and actually what we're going to do is we're going to start folding. We're going to fold our dry ingredients into the eggs and into that nice and airy like this, and we're going to make it a chocolate genoise. Now, you want to be sure this, you see that I'm folding like this. I'm not stirring. I'm folding this. I'm folding the dry ingredients in throughout this cake batter to incorporate that dry ingredients into that nice batter. Then when it's all incorporated, what we're then going to do is we're going to take this batter, put it inside of our cake pans, and we're going to bake these cakes for our big, big chocolate cake. You want to be sure also when you're doing that. I know uh, it gets a little, sounds like a little old after a while. You really want to make sure that you get the bottom and scrape it down, you see? Because you get these dry ingredients like here, and then you look like a fool when your cake is done. <laughs> now, if you want to look like a fool, go ahead. Don't scrape it down. It really doesn't bother me. Just in case, you know, there's the fool police out there. We want to cover that. Covering all angles right now. So, now that we've done that, and I feel, look, we would have been... Anyhow, <laughs> so we've got that all incorporated like this, nice and chocolatey, and then we're going to separate our cake batter like this, as you can see. All right, now, we've done that. Get them inside the oven. Divide the mixture, get them inside the oven. Now, I have some cream in this bowl. You got these kind of bowls, or if not, you always want to make sure, particularly with cream, that you kind of chill the bowl a little bit. It makes the cream sort of aerate a little bit faster. Because what I'm going to do right here now is I'm going to begin to start putting this on with another whisk. And I'm going to start slowly beating this up so that I can make a next thing that I want to make is a chocolate mousse is what I want to make. I figured why not? Why not make a little chocolate mousse amongst friends? <laughs> How am I going to do that? Really simple. We're going to start whisking this cream and still, until it starts getting stiff then I'm going to show you exactly how you do that. Now, beside chocolate cake with chocolate mousse, I think we need a chocolate icing on top of that. All right. So, watch this. 
I've got, a, I've got some butter that I'm going to dilute with hot water that I've got on the stove here. And I'm going to let that butter start melting down a little bit in a sort of a sauce pot. Really simple to make, and you want to talk about delicious. So I've got water, and I've got some butter right now, and we're going to let that heat up and melt. Here, I've got confectionery sugar or powdered sugar that I'm sifting. Okay? Then after that, sifted in this bowl. Since I want it chocolate, I'm going to add some cocoa powder. And that's another reason why you sift things. You see all those little marbles and stuff in there right now? One time I was doing this, I found a bobby doll. It was amazing. It had pumps on, too. Oh, yeah. So, amazing, Doc, you know? Now, I also got some simple syrup. What is that, you may say? Well, it's just water and sugar. Now, once this is all mixed in together, guys, this is how simple it takes. I add a little bit of vanilla in there. Then I take that butter mixture when it's melted, and I'm going to start slowly stirring that in. See, it ain't quite melted yet. How's our cream doing over there, you? Oh, yeah, it's coming along good, babe. <laughs> then you slowly start mixing in the sugar and the cocoa mixture like this, as I'm doing, to make this sort of this icing. So now, we're going to have this icing. We're going to have chocolate mousse in a minute here. I'm going to add all of that butter in there. Oh, yeah, babe. <laughs> How can it not be good, right? Chocolate, butter, sugar, give me a break. <laughs> All right, so now we've got our chocolate icing together. And we've got our cakes and our simple syrup. Watch how simple it, it takes to make this mousse. See the cream is starting to get stiff like this? As soon as it starts to get stiff and it's aerating like this, Instead of adding sugar right now to sweeten it, what we're going to do is we're just going to take some chocolate that we just kind of melt. Hey, if you don't like chocolate, that's okay, you know? You just, you know how chocolate, when you melt it like that, it just kind of gets like, you know, it, well, it gets... <laughs> you know what I'm saying. So what we're going to do is we add that chocolate in there like that, and then... We're going to just slightly mix that chocolate in there to make this chocolate mousse. See that already? How it's coming? Delicious. Now, we've got everything ready. We're going to put together our cake in a second real quick, and I'm going to show you. While you go do what you're going to do, I'm going to dish up this incredible rib roast with potato gratin. Stick around. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome back. Celebrating the steakhouses here in Chicago. Got my friend Mo. Look at that little steak right there with that. the gratin. Oh, look at that baby. All right. Big. Big. What we're going to do now is we started layering our big chocolate cake, and I got this simple syrup like this, the components that we were putting together. Gives it really good and moist. That's what I like to do, the top and the bottom. And then it's basically, I cut them in half. So then I had this layer right here of the chocolate mousse, spread it up real, real good like that in between. And then to top it, we'll put this top layer like this and ice the whole cake so that it's big. <laughs> what is it going to be again? It's going to be big, right? Going to be big. That's right. Actually, when I go see my friend Mo and this cake comes out like this, you know, they don't like do like small little pieces of cake. I, how do you, you got that? So this is how we do it. You know, you're missing something right here. You just give them the That's whole cake like it. that, just right? Give the whole thing out. Step give them the whole thing like that. If you're nice, Mo will cut it for you like this. Let's see if we can get a layer like this, Mo. 
I know this is yeah. a small wedge, just like the child portion right here. Perfect. Look at that, folks. You see that layer like that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. A little bit of vanilla bean ice cream like this. Beautiful. Yeah. A little bit of chocolate just like that. Yeah. There you have it. I'm Emeril Lagasse. Thanks for joining me tonight. See you tomorrow, everybody. Sutton Place Hotel, luxury in the heart of downtown Chicago.